Hello, this is Mr. McGovern, and this is the eighth video in the Circular Motion series of Level 3 NCA Physics. So we're going to talk about Kepler's Law, which is an extension of what we learned in video 7, which was about um, Newton's Law of Gravity, and uh, satellite motion. So we'll start with a bit of a review of a force diagram, uh, look at the formulas and derive uh, velocity and time period, and then discuss what it all means. So in the last video we talked about satellite motion and um, a satellite needs to be in an orbit which is traveling in circular motion. The only force acting on the satellite is the force of gravity from the Earth. And Newton's law of gravity, uh, we have a formula for that. The motion the satellite goes around is circular motion. And because it goes around a circular motion, the total force in circular motion or the centripetal force is given by this formula here, mv squared over r. So what we can do is, because this is the only force, force of gravity, it makes up the total force, we can equate those two formula. In equating the two formula, the force of gravity and the um, total force of circular motion, so the one on the left is the force of gravity, the one on the right is the um, centripetal force, or the total force in circular motion. Let's just remind ourselves what all the letters mean. So the capital G is the universal gravitational constant, it's a an unchanging number. It doesn't matter what planet you're on or what planet you're near, it's the same value. Uh, it's given to you in exams. M is the mass of the object undergoing the circular motion. This is the little m, so in this case it's the satellite. Uh, but you could be asked the question where the moon's orbiting the Earth. And in that case, the moon is the thing orbiting, it gets the little m. The capital M is the mass of the object at the center of the circular motion. In this case, in the picture, it's the Earth. And R is the radius, which is the distance from the center of mass of one to the other. So in this case, it's the Earth's radius plus the height of the satellite. Often in an exam question, just instead of saying this is the, the radius of its orbit, they might give you um, the radius of the Earth and then say the satellite is at a certain height above sea level. And you've got to add those two together to give the total radius of the orbit. So once again, if we equate these two together, one of the things um, you need to do, certainly for higher marks, um, merits and, and most certainly excellence, is go through the following derivations, go through the following simplifications of these two formula. So we've got them um, equated to each other, the force of gravity and the um, centripetal force or total force in circular motion. The first thing we can do is there is a lowercase m or a little m on both sides of that equation, so that can be cancelled out. That's the first thing I've done in that step there. Then I can also multiply both sides by an r, because there's at least one r on both sides, and we get the following simplification. And then, given that capital G, capital M over r equals v squared, I can just find the square root of that to find the velocity. This velocity is the velocity needed to achieve a stable orbit. Now notice a couple of things. It doesn't depend on the mass of the satellite. It only depends on the mass of the Earth, capital M, and the radius of the orbit. So our NASA um, scientists, when they want to send up a satellite into orbit, they have to do this calculation to figure out what velocity they need to achieve for the satellite at a certain height or certain radius uh, for it to be in a stable orbit. The other derivation we can do is, is look at the time it takes the satellite to go around this orbit. Not just the velocity it needs to get to, but um, how much time does it take to do a full orbit around the planet. So these are the derivations we've already got to. Um, but I haven't done the last step, so I've just got to V squared. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, well, an object undergoing circular motion, its velocity can be calculated by 2 pi r over d, which is distance over time. Because the distance around a circle is just 2 pi r, and the time around um, in circular motion is the time period, capital T. So I'm going to substitute that formula for velocity into the um, formula above it. And because it's velocity squared, that 2 pi r over t is going to be squared as well. And then I'm going to open that bracket up, and I get 4 pi squared r squared over t squared on the right hand side and we'll just go to the next page so we can fit it all in so I'll just copy that out again now I'm looking for a derivation of t so I want capital T to be the um, subject of the equation 
So I'm going to multiply that up on both sides so it's not at the bottom of a fraction, it's at the top of a fraction. And then I'm going to make this a bit easier. I think I'm going to multiply both sides by R. And finally get rid of capital G, capital M by dividing both sides by capital G, capital M. So now I've got T squared equals 4 pi squared R cubed over GM and then I can square root to find T. That looks complicated and it is certainly the first couple of times you do it but if you are looking to get high marks it's something that you need to be able to do yourself. So it's something that you can't just follow me doing and say oh yeah I get that. You need to at some point you know, pause the video and see if you can go through it and get that value yourself. Now that formula has a name, it's called Kepler's Law. Kepler didn't go through this derivation himself, he didn't um, understand the relationship between centripetal motion and uh, the force of gravity. He found this experimentally by looking at the orbits of um, planets around the sun and how much time it took them to go around. He found that there was a relationship between the time squared, so the second to last formula, and the radius cubed. Right, so what does it all mean? So this is the first one we found, the velocity of a satellite, and um, we found that the orbital velocity is independent of the mass of the satellite. Now that's important, and that's a, a, an important and good thing, because it means that, because the mass of the satellite doesn't matter, when you get a new person visit the satellite, say for example the International Space Station, or a new delivery of food to the International Space Station, that changes the mass of the International Space Station. So imagine if this formula had the little m in it still. Um, every time you delivered food or a person to the International Space Station, you'd have to recalculate and change that velocity. But it doesn't. So we're, it's a good thing that the universe is built this way. The other formula, um, Kepler's Law, t squared is 4 pi squared r cubed over um, gm. Again, that's independent of the mass of the thing orbiting. And because that... Um, if we know the radius, so looking at, um, as an example, the moon going around the Earth, if we know the radius of the orbit, orbit of the moon, which we do know, and you know the time period it takes for that moon to go around the Earth, which we know, it's about 28 days, then we can rearrange that formula, Kepler's law, to find the mass of the thing in the middle, the mass of the Earth. Um, this is a pretty clever technique. If we, as long as we've got some one thing orbiting another thing, and we can count how much time it takes for that thing to make the orbit, and we know the radius, um, we can calculate the mass of the thing in the middle. So this is how we know the mass of the Earth. This is how we worked out the mass of the Sun. We know the radius from the Earth to the Sun. We know how long it takes the Earth to go around the Sun, 365 days. We can use this formula, rearrange it, and work out the mass of the Sun. So... Once more, this has been quite a heavy um, video in terms of derivations, but if you're looking for um, top marks, it's things that you need to be able to do um, independently yourself.